My name is Dixie Wicker, and I'm a member of El Paso County Master Gardeners Association. And we're here to give uh, information our, on our wonderful rose garden. The first person that will talk will be Press Deer Cup, and she has been a member of the Rose Society for 40 years. And she will give a short history of this beautiful place. After that, MJ, who is uh, also an El Paso Master Gardener with me and chairperson of the Rose Committee and is very dedicated to this beautiful place, she will give a tour with lots of good information on many of the roses that we are so fortunate to have here. I hope you enjoy this video. My name is Press Deercup and I am the current president of the Rose Society. Yes, I have been here for 40 years. I claim this is my second home. We enjoy the beautiful roses and we can um, take the claim of the gentleman, Ted Harris, who was with the uh, Texas Park and Recreation Department, and um, Cap Phillips, two men worked for four years to plan and organize and figure out how they could plant a rose garden here. It was an acre and a half, and they worked for four years, day and night, to make it happen. And they planted 250 rose bushes to begin with, and um, it's quite remarkable. Hi everyone, my name is MJ Tangney. I'm a Master Gardener and a member of the El Paso County Master Gardener Association. I'm also chair of the Rose Committee here, along with about five other Master Gardeners, and we're the ones who tend to the garden most often as far as the pruning, the deadheading, and the weeding. I'm gonna do an overview of roses, so I'm gonna be telling you some different uh, things about roses. Uh, between planting, blooming, times, uh, classifications, etc. There's over 16,000 varieties of roses that are for commerce in the U.S. Right here in our rose garden, we have over 400 varieties of roses. We also have 12 to 1300 uh, rose bushes right now. We did just complete planting of about 40 roses, 26 bare root roses, and uh, 14 container roses just in the last week and a half. And I'll talk about that later in a bit. The types of roses that we have here in the rose garden, and again, these are master gardeners who are volunteering since around 2006 to 2007, started volunteering at the Rose Garden. We have hybrid teas, we have floribundas, we have grandifloras, we have shrubs, miniatures, and also some knockout roses. I'm going to focus on the grandifloras, the floribundas, the um, hybrid teas, a couple of shrubs and some miniatures. Miniatures can range from about six inches, which is pretty short, six to 12 inches, all the way up to hybrid teas, which can be over 12 feet. Not all roses have a fragrance. I notice that when people come out here to visit the garden, one of the first things they do is just lean over the rose and see if it has a fragrance. Just be aware that not all roses have a fragrance and not all of the roses out here in the rose garden have a fragrance. Some have a very strong fragrance, some have a very light fragrance, and some have no fragrance. So if you are in the market for roses and that is important to you, that's just something that you need to do some research on. The blooming time for the roses in our rose garden here in El Paso, we started seeing blooms probably the very first of April. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful amounts of roses blooming right now. The roses will bloom through probably October or through the, the uh, first frost. Some roses bloom one time a year. Some, blooms, some roses bloom several times during the season. Some roses bloom every six to eight weeks. And then there are roses that bloom just continually. And I'll point out that to you. I wanted to tell you a little bit about rose hips. Some of you may have noticed that on roses while you are looking at them. They are like a little acorn shape, like about the size of a pecan, a small pecan. And they come out after rose bloom finishes on some roses, not all. They can be red, orange, yellow. 
They can be used in cooking, they can be used because the birds like them, or you can use them in an arrangement. And again, you won't see rose hips on all roses. And if you look at the roses, if you're able to come out here, which we hope that you do, you'll see that they have not uh, lost their blooming ability because they're just because they're not fertilized. We prune our roses here in January to February for about six weeks, Monday through Friday. We uh, are out here in, in mass. Sometimes we have eight or nine folks. Typically the rule is to prune your roses at least a third down. Now this doesn't count climbing roses, but this counts with all the other roses. Actually our climbing roses are being pruned in the last few years that I've been here by Doc, who is a, just a wonderful master gardener, very, very knowledgeable, and actually teaches several of the classes over the years to interns. He is the, the guru of being able to prune climbing roses. During the blooming season, and this we finish the pruning season, once the blooms have come, we're gonna have to deadhead the roses. So you want to deadhead, not you just don't go and take the bloom off the rose. You go and you go down to the first set of five leaves, right above that, and you prune that or clip it with your pruners about at an angle, 45 degrees. Some people say you don't have to do 45 degrees. I personally still do 45 degrees at an angle, preferably to uh, uh, right above a node that's coming out. If the node's not coming out, don't worry about that. But you, you clip it 45 degree angle uh, right above the first set of five leaves. Now, if you'll look, and we'll, I'll show you in a minute, if you're looking at a rose stem, you might have to go down a little farther than you, than you thought because the first group may be two leaves, maybe three leaves before you hit five leaves. Now, in September, in order to encourage the blooms for the October, the last October flourish of rose blooming, we go down to the second set of five leaves. ARS, or American Rose Society, recognized 37 classes of roses. They're defined by color. You look around our rose garden and you'll see pinks, reds, yellows, oranges, uh, and a variety of those. The actual American Rose Society, what they do in their book is they, they may say if it looks peach to you or orange to you, they may call it an A, they may say A, B in their book, and that would stand for an apricot blend. Not all roses at our municipal rose garden are ours. We are trying to make that from here on out. Um, it's just happened that way. All of the roses that we just purchased are American Rose Society roses. Here we are at the Mr. Lincoln's. In 1966, the American Rose Society designated old garden roses as those roses which existed before 1867. The old garden, garden roses typically have just a wonderful, wonderful fragrance. The most popular of the old garden roses are hybrid teas. That's what this rose is, is a hybrid tea. It's a Mr. Lincoln. If you look at it, it has, it's, can be very tall, it can be much taller than it is because remember, we, we pruned it at least a, down a third uh, in January and February. So it's come back just wonderfully. It blooms all season long, it tolerates the heat, and it does have a very nice fragrance. It has, hybrid teas typically have 30 to 50 petals, which if you like a rose, a full rose, you're gonna find a, a Mr. Lincoln to your liking because it has 30 to 50 petals. The hybrid tea, one of the most significant things about the hybrid tea is if you look at this rose, it's one rose per stem. That's why people so often like it because then they can cut, have a, a wonderful rose bush with hybrid teas and they cut it and they can take several in for uh, like in a vase or in your home. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna demonstrate deadhead a rose, okay? When this rose is spent, meaning it's finished blooming, you don't come along and just snip this part off. You're gonna come down and you're gonna go to, as I said before, the first area where there are five leaves. You're gonna go at an angle and you're gonna snip that off. That encourages the blooming, okay? Here we are at one of my favorite roses in rose bushes in the garden. It's called L, E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. 
It's a hybrid tea. If you look over here, you're gonna see the color of the rose as it starts out. And then it goes to more vibrant pinks. And as it finishes, as you call when as what you call spent, it's gonna be almost a pale white, whitish pink. This rose bushes, these rose bushes here bloom all season long despite the heat. It's a uh, I, these are one of the groups of roses that I love to prune, I mean, and to deadhead, and it has the most wonderful, wonderful fragrance of most of the roses in the rose garden. In fact, Patrick, who was our guru, master gardener for a number of years out here at the rose garden, this was one of his favorite roses, along with another rose that was his namesake, St. Patrick's Rose. Here we are at the two last hybrid tea roses I'm going to show you. This one right here is named Elizabeth Taylor. It has a very nice fragrance. Again, it's a hybrid tea, which means that it is one rose per stem. And finally, the last hybrid tea rose that I'm going to point out here at the Rose Garden is directly across from the Elizabeth Taylor group of roses. This rose is a beautiful yellow. I will tell you that this rose has so many, according to what Doc calls them, are prickles, and a lot of people will call them thorns, but they're actually prickles, which means that when we are pruning them, it is just very, very tricky. We have to really ask somebody who doesn't mind getting stuck to prune these roses, but they are a beautiful rose and have a nice fragrance. Both of these roses, the Elizabeth Taylor and the Marilyn Monroe, both have a nice fragrance. Here we are at the Floribundas, the start of the Floribundas. We've left the hybrid teas, not that there aren't many more hybrid teas in the Rose Garden, but we're going to go and talk about the Floribundas. This particular Floribunda that I'm standing to the side of goes over the canopy and it looks like it's a climber, but it's actually a Floribunda. This Floribunda called Cecile Bruner was planted by a man, a wonderful master gardener, named Jack Makepeace. But he, he planted this, this Cecile Bruner, and I'm sure he would be very, very happy to see it flourishing a number of years later. At another Floribunda, it's called Cherry Parfait. It's another one of my favorites. Doesn't have that much of a fragrance, but does have a slight fragrance. What I really like about this Floribunda cherry parfait is it starts out at the edges a real deep red face to a pinks and then almost in the center it's white so it's just a lovely contrast rose we have probably at least six cherry parfaits in this area this rose right here is a lovely lovely yellow it's called julia child many of you will know that name we have a couple of other julia childs in the upper tiers of the rose garden they don't seem to do as well possibly because they don't get the right sun or the right shade but this julia child does very very well it's small it stays small but it's a very very pretty floribunda again floribunda is large clusters and very long lasting blooms continually every six to seven weeks these particular blooms, this is called simplicity. These particular blooms bloom all summer long. Believe me, I know, I prune them all, or deadhead them all throughout the summer. Here we are at a grandiflora. The interesting part about grandiflora, and this is called Queen Elizabeth, the very first one that was identified as a grandiflora in 1954. What had happened was, that a hybrid tea named Charlotte Armstrong was bred with a Floribunda named Floridora and erupted into a Grandiflora. Again, Queen Elizabeth is the first Grandiflora that came about in 1954. We also have climbers in our rose garden and what's significant about climbers self-evident you can put them along a fence an arbor a trellis what you need to do is you need to make sure how you train it 
typically you you take the large canes and you you put it laterally bend it laterally to make it go in the direction you want and then you tape it the first one is this will scarlet very pretty it actually seems to bloom in clusters it is a climber and if you'll look at it it is climbing laterally in different areas Again, Doc is the one that prunes these climbers in our rose garden in El Paso. We also have a Don Juan, and it's a very pretty red. And this season, Doc actually added a trellis arbor, trellis or arbor, and it, the Don Juan is doing much better than it has in the past because it's really climbing in the directions you want it to go. Finally, let me say something about a rose called Dr. Huey. Some people really like this rose, some people really don't. It is extremely vigorous rose and a very hard rose to kill if you don't want it in your garden. It came about in 1914. It is considered a climber with rambling canes, extremely vigorous. What happens is it originally, this rose was made or bred for rootstock for bread for other roses and what has happened it is so vigorous that you might find it in your own rose garden coming up from a rose bush that you already have if you do see that you need to prune those back because what will happen is those suckers will starve your existing rose bush and i'm certainly sure you do not want that to happen we do have a standalone Dr. Huey in our garden, rose garden here at the uh, El Paso County Rose Garden. And it is very, very pretty. The other interesting thing about Dr. Huey, besides it being so vigorous, is it only blooms once a year and it's blooming right now. And finally, I wanna say something about a rose, a very old rose it was founded in 1868. It's called Zephyrin Druin. I may not be pronouncing that quite correctly, but it is a thornless climber. If you look at the book, it doesn't really say climber, but you can train it as a climber. And what's really nice about this rose is that it is thornless. I actually had a visitor last week with her young daughter and she was looking for a thornless climber. And so I took her to this rose. We're going to talk just briefly about shrubs. We have several shrub roses here. David Austin actually hybridized these. They do resemble old garden roses. When you look at shrub roses, you can put them along a fence or as a, as a hedge. They can be five by five. They're extremely vigorous. They have a habit of sprawling. Two of the roses we'll point out is Graham Thomas which can also be trained as a climber, and then Belinda's Dream. We have both of those shrub roses in our garden, along with our iceberg roses, which is those beautiful white roses, and they are actually surround the events area where people can call to make an appointment to choose to have a wedding ceremony. We're going to talk just very briefly about the miniatures. We just have one small area of miniatures. It's uh, in, in an area that is just a standalone area of miniatures. They have actually increased in popularity. And the reason why is because say if somebody doesn't have much room or they don't have a yard, they can buy a miniature and plant it in a pot. Ours are not in pots, but they are in the ground. They range between like six inches to 30 inches. You can use them in edging beds. And the one that I wanted to point out to you is called an Arizona Sunset. It's a uh, kind of a, a yellow blend, not to be confused with the Rosebush Arizona, which is an orange blend. We wanted to point out to you this wonderful monument. There is a, we have a sister city and it's Marion, South Australia. Marion, South Australia and El Paso, Texas share a common denominator. Both discovered or both started in the same year. So in 1986, 
Marion, South Australia, and El Paso, Texas, shared a 150-year anniversary of its beginning. Marion, South Australia actually donated this plaque, and it's a sundial, so it shows you the time in Australia, South Australia, the same time that it is here in El Paso. Here we are at the end of our journey through the Rose Garden. Again, the master gardeners of El Paso have helped weed, prune, and deadhead since 2007 in the Rose Garden of El Paso. I'm standing next to a statue, a St. Francis statue. It is so much more obviously seen now that several master gardeners did a very deliberate and wonderful pruning of, our, of the grotto. At one time, even last year, you could hardly see St. Francis and many people miss this statue. This statue has been here since the beginning of the Rose Garden, 1959. The, the Council of El Paso Garden Clubs is the one that donated it. And at that time, there were many more garden clubs. Right now, I believe there's only a couple. But again, it's a beautiful statue, a beautiful grotto, and a wonderful, wonderful donation by that, the Garden Club Council in 1959. I want to thank everyone who joined us today. I want to thank Dixie and Prez uh, and the videographer, Mario, for doing this, this uh, journey through our wonderful, wonderful Rose Garden. I certainly hope you've enjoyed our trip to the Rose Garden, and I really, really, truly hope that you come out here and that we see you in this beautiful place, the Rose Garden of El Paso, Texas. Thank you.